Big usage changes in week 10. That's what we're going to talk about today on Stealing Bananas. Brought to you by WinBet. I'm Ben Gretsch. You can find my newsletter at stealing at bengretsch.substack.com. With me, as always, is Sean Siegel. You can find all his great work at Rotovis. Sean, week 10 was a really interesting one. I was just telling you kind of before the show, and we're going to go through a lot of interesting players. But it was one when I was going through stealing signals where you had a lot of these teams coming out of the week nine buy, and a lot of times coming out of the buy, teams will maybe consolidate what they're doing a little bit, seem to get that in some spots. You had the trade deadline guys, and we had a lot of movement this year fitting into their roles. Uh, you know, Jeff Wilson, Kadarius Tony, Christian McCaffrey, interesting discussions about a lot of those types of players. We also had some big injuries, unfortunately, but um, you know, Cooper Cup being probably the biggest one. A lot of really interesting stuff this week in terms of and in some under the radar stuff as well but that was one of my big takeaways this week from stealing signals this has probably been the biggest week in terms of usage sort of shifting and it kind of makes sense we have the 17 game se uh, seasons now we had a lot of turnover in the off season we talked about how it's been a really high variance for sort of first month couple of months it seems like week 10 was a turning point for a lot of these teams where it was this is how we're going to be for the stretch run. And maybe we shouldn't be surprised by that, but um, pretty interesting to, to look around the league and, and, and see the way things are shaping up for the fantasy stretch run. And this kind of thing is always relevant. The players who are going to be the in, biggest impact performers of the stars, relevant. The players who can, are going to emerge and become league winners, relevant. But within the context of a season where we've had a lot of injuries shake things up and where we haven't had a ton of big performances outside of the stars, it, it feels even more relevant maybe than usual. One of the guys that you had mentioned to me as we were having sort of our, our pre-show hour, hour and a half chat is Dalvin Cook. And he's someone who I think is a provocative and controversial player as we think about the dynasty trade deadline that often happens before week 11 in a lot of leagues. Last week, we did the fun exercise where we projected round one and round two of 2023 drafts. And one of the guys that I put in there at the end of round two that I felt uncomfortable with was Cook because his scoring numbers this season haven't been fantastic. He's up into that age range where you know that minor dings are going to be penalized very heavily, probably by his own team, but definitely by drafters. And yet you look at Dalvin Cook, and he is this big-time talent, and he's in an offense that is one of the few offenses that I actually feel pretty comfortable with. Now, are there things about the Vikings offense that I'd like them to do slightly differently that I think they could do a little bit better? Obviously. I mean, if Kirk Cousins had a little bit more arm strength and was a little bit more dynamic, would that help everything? It obviously would. And yet, at the same time, I think you have to like the direction the Vikings are going. I think I'm a little bit higher on them maybe than you are. But then we kind of step back and we look at Dalvin Cook. And I mean, this is a guy where his EP numbers right now are well below the norm. He's at 14.8. He's at two fantasy points over expectation. The long touchdown run obviously helps that out. But we were looking at him in recent seasons as being this like 15 and five guy. We know that that's not going to be sustainable, but is he going to have the overall numbers and scoring profile? And then you kind of drill down to it. He had this weaker stretch this season where he didn't really look like himself. Weeks two to week five, he doesn't even hit 70% of the snaps in any of those occasions. And then even if you think about this last week and how some of the things change, the and, and change in game, right? So we have the Bills up 17 to 7. The Vikings go on this drive where they do get into the red zone. They have a first and goal at the two, and it's Alexander Madison out there. He gets stuffed, loses some, some yardage. He gets a reception later in that drive when they're probably already more or less capitulated because they've got second and goal from the 17, but he catches a pass. I was watching some of these early plays and it didn't feel like Cook had that much burst. And so to have him not in there on these high leverage plays early, and there's a little bit of difference sometimes too, whether it's early or late when you're thinking about, you know, giving a guy a breather. So I'm thinking to myself, well, very quickly placing him at the end of round two 
doesn't seem to make that much sense. I mean, he may be done. Then he breaks off an 81-yard touchdown run. And Ben, that wasn't the only really positive note about his role this week and maybe where he's going. Yeah, I mean, if you think about Cook and sort of who the player he is and what his upside scenarios are, you talked about the 15 and 5 thing, which refers to, you know, expected fantasy points, rushing 15 expected per game, and then receiving about five. You're always talking about the double double guys, the 10 and 10s, where we can get up to 10 receiving expected points. Cook has had the rushing expected points be really high at 15 before, in part because his goal line role can be so massive. And there's that one year. I guess, was it 2020 when he had the really huge year um, where it was just an, an absurd number of carries inside the five yard line. I remember writing about it, I guess, in the 2021 off season about how there's a lot of variance on that, even on the team level, let alone on the player level, whether he would be the guy who continues to get all those touches, which you just referenced out. He hasn't always been that in this game. Also, CJ Ham has you know, the fullback has a three yard run. We like to see the teams that just give their running back the ball every time down there. The Bengals have been doing this with Joe Mixon. It's been very good for Joe Mixon's value that no one else is getting carries down there. And and they've also had, they've also run hot in the ways that I'm talking about, like the 2020 Vikings did in terms of plays volume down there. And so Mixon is just racking up carries in close, which has been very valuable. Some of that is high variance. And so it's part of the reason I've been a little concerned about Mixon, but you undeniably can't argue with the fact that for a guy like Mixon or Cook back in 2020, you rack up a ton of, you know, expected points, you you rack up a lot of potential to score actual fantasy points when you're the only guy they're using down there. They're not using an Alexander Madison. They're not using a CJ Ham on the occasional carry or maybe not doing a lot of QB sneaks. Cook hasn't necessarily had that this year, which has been a problem, but he can also be an efficient player too. So you're talking about the 15 and 5, you're talking about a lot of expected rushing points, plus hopefully some efficiency, like this ability to run for the 81-yard touchdown that he showed. He's been that guy in the past. The question with him is always on the receiving side. Can it be more than five expected points as a receiver? Can he actually have a solid receiving role? That really big 2020 season, it wasn't a massive expected role, but he was efficient on it and he did put up receiving points. It's been a little bit of a concern at times. You look at his routes per drop back this year so far, and I'm just going to read them week by week. This is the big note for me this week. And I've talked about it a little bit since their week seven buy, but he was at 55% of the routes, 54% in weeks one and two, which is okay for a lead running back. You don't see running backs because they're pass blocking some, there's rotation, get up above like 80% typically. You would like to see an elite back, a first round back, be at least at 60%, 65. Some of them can be at 70. This is one of the reasons I'm not super concerned about Christian McCaffrey. He was still at 70 3%, I think, this week of their dropbacks where he ran a route. It was a very run-heavy game for the Niners. They leaned on Elijah Mitchell a little more. I think they're going to have plenty of games where they lean on on McCaffrey's receiving ability, and and that was a very positive part of his role. Cook started at 55 54%, not not massive routes numbers. But in week three, it actually, he kind of picked up some injuries early. It really cratered, 24%, 29%, 21%, 29%. Four straight weeks leading into their buy, sub 30% of dropbacks that he was running a route on. Week seven buy comes out in week eight and runs 43% again. And I wrote a little bit about that. And some signals said, positive note. We're, we're seeing the routes bounce back. He got the week off. He maybe is a little healthier. Week nine, it was up to 56%, higher than even those first two weeks, right in that range. This week, it was up to 75%. So what we're seeing now is, Definitely that trend that I was talking about writing a little bit. Maybe he's a little healthier coming off the bye. I think we're definitely seeing that. They're willing to unleash him more in the passing game. Nothing like what we saw in weeks three to six, where he was sub 30% of the routes. This is three straight weeks where it's increased. It's been pretty strong all all three weeks. I would expect his receiving role to then be stronger down the stretch. And then you talk about the team context stuff. And you think about the Vikings are now tied with the Eagles after their you know, controversial loss on Monday Night Football. Eagles do have the head-to-head tiebreaker right now. The Vikings might have a path to the number one seed if the Eagles do lose again. They're going to play every game like it matters. I mean, even if they start to lose some games and don't have a path to the one seed, their season matters right now, right? And so that matters to me. I compared him to DeAndre Swift to you a little bit. Both guys who have some of these potentially recurring injuries that we're not always sure about. I do 
often have concern about investing in Dalvin Cook because we never know when that shoulder stuff is going to crop back up. Swift is a guy I'm concerned about getting shut down because the Lions season, you know, they've won a couple games in a row now. They're an exciting team, but it's not going anywhere. I think there's a possibility he picks up another nick at some point. He's got so many areas of his body that are, you know, have been on the injury report, and he maybe just gets shut down for a, for a while if that happens. Cook is a guy, when you look at the team perspective for the Vikings, that if he picks up something, that shoulder starts to hurt again. I think there's a much stronger possibility that they're going to try to have him play through that. He's going to want to try to play through that based on where they're at, based where their season is. I mean, if it happened this week, they might sit him for a couple weeks and get him ready for the playoffs. But I do think they're going to want him to, and he's going to want to be involved as much as possible because the Viking season obviously very much matters. Everything matters for them the rest of the way. They want to try to win every game they can. And, and you talking about Madison not necessarily performing at the goal line. I mean, what we're seeing with Dalvin's usage these last couple of weeks I think also indicates they still very much think he's their best back. Some of the stuff from weeks three to six, maybe they weren't so sure. And especially with him being a little banged up, they wanted to get Madison worked in. And it's a little bit more of a split right now. It's I think very clear based on the usage numbers that this is a team, obviously their season matters. They want to win and they think he's one of their best players. And then to a lot of people, that's going to sound silly to suggest otherwise anyway, but it's a good time, I think, even if you're like me and concerned about Dalvin Cook's health at any given point, it's a good time to take that risk in season when you know the Vikings are good and they, they're they playing hard and everything matters and is going the right way. And you know that Cook is healthier since the bye based on this usage numbers and things seem to be trending up. But also, even though he's had some good games recently, he's still going to be expensive to acquire. Also, hasn't scored so well yet that he would be untouchably expensive to get in a trade. I got a, a question from somebody who was weighing an offer to trade away AJ Brown for cook and George Pickens last week. And it's always so hard for me to tell people to trade AJ Brown. And we talked through it a little bit. It was a half PPR league where I think the running back depth matters more. They do. They did have some good running backs, but it was like, man, you have the potential now to have, three really strong running backs. I think their roster had Ken Walker and someone else, but you could be flexing a running back in half PPR and they're running backs that we know are healthy at week 10. I mean, if we we always talk about the, you know, zero RB and the philosophies of, of how running back value can change so much, but if we could make draft decisions in August, knowing who's going to be healthy in, in big roles in week 10, we still think running back scoring points matters, right? I mean, Sean, you're, for the listeners who aren't watching us on YouTube are nodding along. I mean, this is something we've talked on the show about a ton. We think running back scoring matters, and yet it's the volatility of the health and the and the ways that the, the uh, workloads can be allocated and the ways that team seasons can go and they might shut guys down. That's what can get tricky. Cook is on a good team. He's in a good spot. He's playing a lot right now feels like a really good bet to make for the rest of the year. He does. And if you're playing in a redraft format, he's a must acquire. And there are a variety of packages, including multiplayer packages. This is one of the advantages of building depth into your roster, even in some shallower leagues to where you're going to have other members of your league on the edge of making the playoffs where they need multiple guys. And this is how you can make these win-win trades where you need a Dalvin Cook, they need two or three players that can help both of you accomplish your objectives and hurt your lead mix. And that's one of the reasons why being very easy to work with and easy to trade with is, I think, the biggest key in any kind of fantasy league where trades are available. And so that's what I'd be looking at in redirect. As you mentioned, in Dynasty, it's so much trickier because Cook is one of these backs where when his value goes, it's going to go to zero in a heartbeat. And If you're trying to build for more than just this one season, we talk all the time where even if you have the strongest lineup, your chances of actually winning once you get into the playoffs, you have to win the semis, you have to win the finals. Even with the best team, they're not as good as maybe it feels like it is. You want to have a permanent window as opposed to a one-year window. The fact that he hasn't scored that well, especially before this long touchdown, he was probably acquirable for a price that would work and allow you to mitigate that risk or at least balance those risks. Now it's going to be trickier. Had a a trade offer come in today 
in a pretty high stakes version of the RV Triflex League that wanted Brees Hall back. And I mean, I can understand why I mean, that's a very reasonable kind of offer to send out. Those are the types of offers because you're, you're trying to get a feel for what your league mates are going to do. Brees Hall is still someone, even in a team that has a shot to win. If you make that move, Brees Hall is still a player where I'd much rather have him. I mean, he's borderline the overall RB1 for me in Dynasty, even though you know you're not going to get any points for him the rest of the way this year. And this year matters. I mean, this year winning a title will help you. You get bragging rights if you're in that kind of league. You know, you pay for your entry fee for the next four or five years in money leagues. Winning this year matters. And yet I think we still want a Brees Hall type. You and I have been having sort of long-term discussions in our RV Triplex to either acquire Dalvin Cook for a pick or maybe swap Barkley for Cook and get something else back. Those have been difficult discussions specifically because of the risk and the upside attached to Cook. It can be hard to get done, but I think it's a reasonable and meaningful conversation to have with your league mates right now because it could help both parties if you can kind of thread that needle and get the right deal done. And Sean, that brings us to our win bet segment of the week. Sign up today to receive a special sports offer. Bet $100, win $100. Download the WinBet app now or visit wynnbet.com to start winning. And I really this week wanted to get your thoughts on Christian Watson because I felt like I was getting a little bit ahead of myself at stealing signals and watching the game. And I kind of couched my thoughts. I'm just going to start with my hot take and then which I didn't write in stealing signals. And then our win bet segment will be you telling us what's actually happening. This will be the biggest game of Christian Watson's season. It might be the biggest game of his career. I did not think he actually looked that great in this game is sort of my take his first long touchdown. Again, he had the big drop back in week one catches it on his arms. He's got that whole body catch thing going on, which doesn't necessarily matter. We know drops aren't a huge deal but just didn't look very smooth. He got another deep target not long after where he stops running and then sort of makes an uncompetitive dive and Rogers looked annoyed. But as the game, and so I had that stuff in my notes, like at that point that, you know, kind of fade the one first long touchdown as the game progressed, he scores two more TDs. And so then you got to be like, well, he got so much volume season high, 91% of the routes, massive season high for him has not been that involved. More air yards in this game than a season to date combined, 164, 1.10 whopper that led week 10. His second long touchdown, I felt like was another one where he sort of just caught it off his forearms, not with his hands. His third one, interestingly enough, is he's running away from the defender on a crosser, balls kind of thrown to his head, totally different hand position, right? When you're catching it with your thumbs down, looked very clean, hand catching and everything. But for a deep threat which is ostensibly what he is as a really good athlete he's not going to have a lot of these crossers where he's just wide open like he was on that third touchdown he doesn't seem to have good deep ball skills that's something that's been a concern for him that's probably a massive overreaction because he does have a great quarterback and they'd have no one and he just scored three touchdowns but not ideal also that in a three touchdown game he only catches four balls for 100 yards and he has the two long tds it's not like a 180 yard game you give any of the good receivers in the league. I don't want to compare them to the greats already, but you give any of them a game where they hit on two long touchdowns, they don't have a 105-yard game or whatever he had in this game. They have a 180-yard game. And, and Rodgers only threw 20 passes, and there's reasons for this, but I feel like this was a lot of things coming together, and I guess the way I would describe it is we kind of compare them to MVS before. I could see MVS have had a, have, have had this type of game in the Packers offense. I was going to go back and look if he ever had any three TD games, but – they probably would have looked like this, eight targets, four catches, 100 yards, and three TDs, not 180 yards and seven or eight catches. I guess I'm still just a little bit concerned. The three TDs are the huge high-level no, and the routes bump and everything, and how athletic he was, right, and is, and, and, and just getting as open as he did. Am I overreacting and thinking that this was a pretty fluky performance, or is this a rookie who extending towards the end of the season we need to be really in on? The answer in a weird way, I think, is all, all of those things. Okay. In that, I mean, if you can sell at a really high level at a new price, if you can sell above where he was going in rookie drafts, then I think it makes sense to go ahead and do this because the uncertainty, even with this huge game, is still extreme. 
I mean, Watson was such a fun prospect because he's so difficult to evaluate. You get this older prospect at a small school where so many of the numbers were bad. Blair Andrews did a fantastic machine learning piece on the rookie wide receiver class as he always does so much cool info there didn't really focus on Watson because he comes from this different group Connor O'Driscoll who dominating best ball again he's got the battle royale articles for you on Saturday everyone knows how awesome Connor is he put together a piece looking at how Watson is just you know a massively overrated prospect based on some of those things and yet we know that it was a unique path and you had this situation where in his final season on a per route basis, he was pretty solid there. When you look at someone like Cooper Cup, we know these older guys from small schools can go and play at the NFL level in unique circumstances. It's not impossible. Now, Cup very different because he was an utterly dominant player in college. Watson, not the same. I like Watson specifically because I love the guys with massive outcome ranges these guys where the top and the bottom are so high and low. I like to play those particular players. I think that this game is exciting because it shows what the draft gurus who were high on him were seeing. It explains what the Packers saw in him. It was a perfect manifestation of what they want him to be able to do. (laughs) You can just imagine what people will be saying if he doesn't for whatever reason, not think that he's going to be the target on that one perfectly thrown pass. And he adds an an additional 58 yard touchdown to his line, right? You mentioned the Whopper. And I think that that is at least mildly relevant in that. I mean, I on Monday worked through all of the top scoring wide receivers from this week. And so many of them did have a ton more volume. You mentioned if you have an actual absolute star, that person's going to go and, you know, have a 200 yard game when they have this type of performance, but it does, at least underline a little bit that a lot of the reason why that wasn't in the mix and why his target volume actually even is better. is just that, like you say, Rogers didn't throw that much. I mean, there's a concern that they probably won't in the short term. I mean, Watson's somebody who's actually available in not many, but some, I mean, he was available in some of our main events to bid on this week. I mean, that's how poorly he's played to this, ex- to this point and, or that's how injured he's been. The other problem that we've had with evaluating him is he's dealt with two different but limiting injuries for a non-first round rookie, especially one who didn't play at a high college level and was going to have to be a little bit of a project. The thing that is kind of exciting for me, again, in this one too, is it's not just tested athleticism. We do have some guys who show up really well on the freak score and that kind of thing. But you know they've got an extensive run at the college level in offenses where that really should have manifested itself in more production. And you watch them play for people who like to bring in that element of evaluation. And it's either demoralizing or disconcerting. And you think that that tested athleticism doesn't manifest itself on the field, so it doesn't really matter that much. And we know that athleticism is overdrafted at the wide receiver position. So all those things are red flags, but then you watch Watson as a college player or you watch him like in a game like this, and you're like, I mean, people cannot match up with him. I mean, he's a a big dude too. And that part also kind of gets missed because he's so fluid as he's so explosive. I think teams are going to have a hard time taking him away. I mean, you're going to have to put specific coverages in or he's simply going to run away from the way that you are covering most other players. You get guys that wide open, you have Aaron Rodgers throwing them the ball, you're going to have some games like this. I don't think you have to sprinkle in that many, and they're not going to be three touchdown games, but you talk about a touchdown and 125 yards. You talk about a 75-yard game with two touchdowns. If you're going to sprinkle in performances like that that are just awesome for fantasy managers. And two, I mean, we we also really like Romeo Dobbs, and I don't think any part of that is dead. He looked like he was about to ascend. You think about Rodgers and you know his constant threats to retire. Is he going to be part of this team? for more than just this season, if they can finish hot with both of these guys looking like future stars, I mean, you have a chance now for Aaron Rodgers to be their quarterback for the next five years. I mean, he doesn't look washed up physically. He looks like someone who's a disgruntled old man, right? If you change that to being fired up about your team and your teammates, the sky really seems like the limit here. I mean, this is just very exciting, even though you know that the floor is still basically zero and that Watson has washed out of the league in another 
18 months because he's not going to be a great catcher of the football. If he can be decent, he should be a big time performer. Sean, there were some interesting trade deadline acquisition usage shifts as well that I thought were really cool in week 10. I mean, when we saw already in week nine, TJ Hawkinson's really big role coming out the gate and that stuck and that was cool to see. And he seems like a really nice tight end for the stretch run, you know, operating off of what Justin Jefferson can do. And by the way, Justin Jefferson, maybe the best single game by a wide receiver that I've ever seen. I mean, I, I didn't, I'm not old enough to have seen, you know, Jerry Rice's monster games and the Super Bowls and things like that. The highlights I've seen a lot of them, he's kind of running free. And I mean, he's incredibly good, but there was a stat that Justin Jefferson had something like nine uh, from next gen stats, had something like nine catches that had a completion percentage or probability, their estimated probability of 50% or lower. And no one else in the next gen stats era has had more than six in an individual game. It was three clear of what any other receiver had done in one game. And that's how it looked when you watched it. I mean, that's that, the was, beauty of playing with Kirk Cousins. Yeah, <laughs> is everything sub 50%. Uh, but what an incredible, incredible game by him. Obviously going to draw a ton of more attention the rest of the way. And, and we just have to do a quick little asterisk in here where we point out that uh, for those people are reading Stealing Signals, which I would assume is everybody, that you and Denny are wrong. That it was the greatest catch of all time? Oh, no. The but... idea that the defensive back is helping him make that catch. I'm inaccurate. comparing it to the greatest catches of all time. So my, my argument is there, was a lot, there were people making some very serious cases well after the game not just reactionary cases, that this was the greatest catch of all time, Justin Jefferson's catch. My argument, and I've seen it elsewhere, and it's mostly been mocked, and I mocked myself a ton as I wrote it up in Stealing Signals. Colin Kelly is is team Ben and Denny. He voted heavily on that one. We had a That ball probably goes debate. to the ground in most situations without the force from the defender's hand kind of helping hold it up. There's a little bit of – there's so much skill in that play. The, the elevation, pulling it away from the defender – I said it's still one of the greatest catches of all time. I said I would probably call it the most improbable catch of all time on par with like the helmet catch and better than the helmet catch. I think not particularly close to the helmet catch, although the helmet catch obviously being in the Super Bowl matters. But I was arguing from just a play perspective, more improbable than the immaculate reception and some of those things, which is like one bounce that was, you know, crazy. And then if you go back and watch your immaculate reception, one of the cool things in that play is like, Franco Harris was like pass blocking and then he just takes off downfield and runs like 20 yards for no reason. And then the ball bounces right to him. It's like, why is he even doing that? What hustle? Like, I mean, there's some cool elements to that play, but nothing like what Jefferson did from the, the point of lifting off and trying to make a play on it to the point where the play is over everything that he did on that play, just so instinctive and incredible. I'm just saying relative to like the Odell Beckham catch from a pure skill perspective, there's a minor element where like, Jefferson needed a little bit, not necessarily needed, because we don't know what would have happened if the defender's hand wasn't there. Maybe Jefferson pulls that in by himself if the defender loses control right away. It's just a little bit of it that doesn't like mar it for me, but I don't think you can call it the greatest catch of all time. When the, it's like it's like the Odell Beckham catch, but yet with a defender pulling the ball no. away from Beckham during the entire play. No, we're just kind of joking. It was an, it was an amazing catch either way you look at it. And it just so fun to watch. It if it were a postseason catch to get even more attention, although sure it'd be hard to get more attention. But for a regular season catch, too, because it's not just the time in the game where it's this almost impossible to convert fourth down that's going to lead to the Vikings losing, right? Because even though they don't score, I mean, what happens is predicated on them getting the ball down to the one-inch line, obviously. Right. So it creates that play. But this game now, and the, these other games are going to still be played, and so there's so much to still happen. You can't say this is going to determine who wins. Last year, obviously, you have wild card teams that come out and meet each other in the Super Bowl. But in terms of shifting probabilities, the Bills now, their path to the number one seed greatly diminished, even though, again, plenty of games are still to be played. It's a huge game for the Kansas City Chiefs, for example, because having lost the tiebreaker, they have to finish a game clear. Huge for them, especially now when you look at the relevant or the relative schedule strengths that they're going to face. But as you mentioned, now placing the Vikings in a shot to be the one seed that by astronomically important again, when you're thinking about probabilities. So yeah, in terms of winning the Super Bowl and, and how it changes your path, even though it's a regular season catch, the importance of it, absolutely gigantic. Ben, we had like five 
insane one-handed catches this week to the point where you sort of wonder we've we've been a little frustrated in a couple of situations this year there was a Garrett Wilson play early where it looked like he could easily put a second hand up and caught a touchdown you and I because we have Jerry Judy starting in some of our leagues again from an injury perspective that one an absolute dagger this week to lose the guy in the first play of the game but Jerry Judy a potential touchdown catch midway through the season where he doesn't put a second hand up in those situations easy to do put your hands up and catch the ball many of the catches this week probably only happen with the one hand and there were so many of them this was a gross week to watch football from an overall perspective with all of these run heavy game plans and then games where they did pass and passed with absolutely no success but in terms of individual plays this was a fantastic week one of the best weeks you'll ever see yeah completely agree with that and and yeah i mean what a fantastic play by Jefferson just want to emphasize that again clearly the best of the bunch and and I completely agree with you fourth and 18 they had to get it to win that game winning that game so massive for everyone you know for them you you talked about how it's very detrimental to the bills I mean and I would just add massive for the for the Vikings in terms of buying in and believing in all this stuff I mean there's been a lot of talk about them not not being frauds, but like maybe not being as good as their record. And this was definitely the game where a lot of people were then saying, you, you got to believe in the Vikings now. And I don't necessarily disagree with that. I also made a point that like, yeah, I mean, the way this game played out was right in line with the arguments that everyone was making, where that they get some some fortunate breaks in some of their wins. And they got another, you know, another few here, the Josh Allen fumble, obviously, the Josh Allen interception late when they could have kicked a field goal, the tie. I mean, that, that very well could have been a tie. I thought we were headed for a tie in that game. Um but at the same time, just going into to Buffalo and contending and being there late and, and putting yourself in a position to benefit from fortune and stuff, huge for them from like the, the perspective of their season and, and what their players believe and all of those things, that matters. I mean, they're, they're already obviously really buying in all the Kirk Cousins chain stuff and everything after their win in Washington. I mean, it seems like a locker room that's really excited about their success so far. But I had some Vikings fans also on some, on, on some thoughts kind of – talking to me on Twitter, not, not really coming at me or nothing that negative, but just sort of maybe people will buy in now. And I mean, my, my thing to Vikings fans, and again, I've said this on the show before I grew up a Vikings fan. I don't look at this. Like I need everyone to buy in. I look at this, like, man, this is awesome. Like if, if they are getting lucky, like that so dramatically improves their odds in the playoffs in a weak NFC that you're going to get home field advantage against some probably inferior opponents. If they somehow get the one seed, I mean, the difference between having to face First of all, having to play a wild card game, but then it, it, assuming you can win that against the seven seed, whoever that might be, you go on to the next round and you're the two seed, you get another home game, but that three seed could probably be the Niners, I think, or, I mean, the Niners might end up being the seven seed or something. We don't know, but it, it, there's some other good teams in the NFC. If you're the one seed and you automatically get the lower seeded team out of the wild card weekend than the two seed, again, assuming the two seed wins, you might get the six team upsetting the three or a five, four, some type of fluky outcome. You're, you're looking at a potential really not soft, but favorable matchup in the divisional round as well. And then you get the conference championship home field advantage as well, which is so massive. I mean, this could be incredible for Minnesota. And I, I mean, what, what I'm saying is like, who cares if no one's giving you credit for being eight and one, look at the advantages of being eight and one. You're, you are a Super Bowl contender because the NFC is so weak at this point. It's not that hard to get there. <laughs> And it's, it's especially useful to have some lucky wins if you're an ascending team because the Vikings are an ascending team. They've got the new coaching staff. They've got these elite players. It makes a lot bigger difference to get a fluky win if you're on the way up and you stack some of those and you can be a different team when it matters than a fluky win for teams that aren't going anywhere. So that's huge for them. And to kind of build on what you're saying, I love the Vikings from the perspective of this is one of the few teams – that really can attack you in multiple ways on offense. We see a lot of these teams where they feel like they're going to win. And the 49ers game, when you consider their weapons, was absolutely disgusting. The fact that they cannot develop multiple passing weapons at the same time and blitz teams is a real worry for them because you don't want to let these teams stay close. You have other teams like the Chiefs and the Bills who have been dynamic through the air but have struggled to run at times. Now there are some elements to where struggling to run can actually be good for you, but the Vikings have both Justin Jefferson and the player we were just talking about and Dalvin Cook. And then that Hawkinson addition 
is a crucial piece for them. If you have a team with a young coach who's going to bring some positive to you there, you have a pedestrian QB, but you have the ability to beat people through the air and on the ground to not be pigeonholed into a certain type of offense to be able to call the plays that you need to win a first half against some team to come from behind in the fourth quarter against a different team. They have the right style of offense to play in their dome at home through the playoffs. Yeah. There are so many positives there. There's a lot of ways to get there. And then, I mean, we've seen Super Bowl upsets. You get two weeks to prepare. Things can happen. If they can somehow get into the one seed, again, basically what I was trying to say is if you have like, you know, I'm not trying to pick on the Giants here. They're seven and two. But if the Giants make the playoffs, and I think they will because they're seven and two. I mean, it seems like they're probably headed that, that way. But let's say they fall off a little bit like a lot of people expect they might. Let's say they finish 10 and seven or something. They get in as the six seed or they finish 11 and six, whatever. They get in as the six seed. They go beat a three seed. If you're, and say the two seed wins, right? If you're talking about the Vikings or the Eagles, there's a pretty big advantage. And again, I'm still not trying to pick on the Giants. If they make the playoffs and win a playoff game, that's a good thing. But pretty big advantage to playing the Giants in the second round, which any upset like that that would happen in the wild card round is going to be from a lower seed. And you're almost certainly going to then play them as the one seed. Huge advantage to playing that team in that second round as opposed to the 49ers or the Bucs if the Bucs get going and, and, and look good down the stretch as the NFC South champions or what have you. I mean, we don't know how this is all going to play out, but I would much rather play the Giants or the Seahawks. Who, look, the Seahawks have played great football, but uh, I think they're probably not going to win the NFC West. Probably the Niners are going to win. You know, prob- let, me, you know, let me know when I'm wrong about that. But um, if that team, the Seahawks are a team that can go in and win a playoff game, I think, because they are good enough they're a six seed and they go win a playoff game on the road. You'd want to host them as opposed to hosting, like I said, the 49ers or the box or the Cowboys with their great defense. I mean, those you, I think Vikings fans should stop worrying about people not telling them that their team's on is or like as good as their record and be super stoked. That you have an eight, one record, no matter how you got it. Like that's, that's how I would look at it and how I feel about it. But setting aside all that, I mean, very fun conversation. That was a, incredible game i mean such a fun game but the hawkinson stuff was interesting i will note on the other side of that game another really interesting thing sean you and i have talked about early on that the thesis for isaiah mckenzie always kind of had to be that he had to get all the routes and he hasn't been getting all the routes and everyone's sort of forgotten about isaiah mckenzie but in week nine last week finally got up to 67 percent of the routes that was his first game over 60 percent week 10 here he gets up to 80 percent so we are finally seeing Isaiah McKenzie in that slot role, getting an 80% route role type of you know usage in a game where the Bills threw a ton. He was a pretty much full-time player, pretty huge for him to potentially have some PPR value down the stretch. I'm not saying for sure that he's going to hit in a massive way. Obviously, Stephon Diggs is, is so entrenched as the number one there. But if you were ever in on Isaiah McKenzie, this is the role that he needed. And so on, the, on that side, I thought that was an interesting note. Clear and I'll have to buy these out. guys right now. I mean, we talk about how expensive he got during draft season, how expensive really all the bills were. Now, obviously, you want to get some exposure to the bills. We're not saying don't get it. But when you're talking about some of these other players and what can happen down the stretch, I think that you have to sell a player like McKenzie during draft season. And then when he's dropped in your leagues, you have to add him back to the end of your roster. I think someone like James Cook, I mean, yeah, you probably want to get some exposure because this could have played out differently where James Cook blows up and is a league winner right from the beginning. So I think he was a very reasonable pick. But certainly when you're talking about can you buy a little bit low before the dynasty trade deadline for Cook, do that. If he is available, we added him to some of our redraft rosters. But this is another week where Singletary actually comes out and looks very good at the beginning. He actually scores some rushing touchdowns, which has you know not been the case for him most of the year. But then they stop him throughout the rest of the game. You could see – I mean saying this as Singletary fans, you could certainly see the tide turn and having Heinz lurking is something that keeps the price down, but it doesn't necessarily look like he's going to be a huge impact guy. It's sort of bizarre to Duke Johnson getting some work in this game. Yeah. Now the time to, to buy those bills after people have gotten frustrated that they didn't get the performance that they were looking for, but it's still more or less the same thesis where you have this Buffalo bills offense. On the Duke Johnson thing, I made a little note that I felt like that was a pretty good indication that they're just not comfortable with Hines in terms of understanding the scheme, understanding the offense and those things yet, because there's not really any other explanation for why Johnson would be active and involved in the offense for the first time all year. 
I don't know that that necessarily means that Hines is not going to be used the rest of the year, right? It's just probably that he's not up to speed yet. They're doing every team does these trade deadline acquisitions a little bit differently. Hines was a very eleventh hour acquisition that they maybe weren't going out and planning for and acquiring in a, in a way that they're like, we know what we're giving up, we know what we're getting. Um, like the Vikings maybe were when they went and got Hawkinson. They're like, this is what we're going to do. This is how we're going to slot him in and all that stuff. Seems like the Bills were like, we're going to add talent. I think they'll find ways to use him, but. Not not encouraging, obviously, for Hines that um, or even for Cook that those guys were involved. And also that Singletary still had a 70 percent snap share. I mean, they 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 really liked Devin Singletary as well. And, and we've seen that in some of their biggest games. We talked about this early in the year when they play the Ravens When they play tough teams and they get in these good games like they seem to lean heavier on Singletary. Um, so, yeah, I mean, positive for him. But we were and talking about stuff in the second half, but he did have I just. As a Singletary fan, I have to throw out, he did have one of those perfect Devin Singletary runs from the past where it was almost Barry Sanders-like, where the change of direction got three different guys on the same run, slices down inside the five-yard line. So we're going to hang our hat on, and on then, one Singletary run this year. Yeah, and then you got two more carries in a row right after that run, scores a touchdown, and then a little bit later, Cook has a nice run down to the one, and they pull him and bring in Singletary, and he scores the TD on that. So Singletary got to stay on after his nice run and score a short touchdown. And then also to come on after cook. And it really felt like cook was just the change of pace. They're not going to just let cook keep riding it, you know, into the end zone. Like for example, the Niners showed they were willing to do with Elijah Mitchell when he had some good runs, keep riding him the rest of the way, even though, you know, Taylor, uh, excuse me, McCaffrey still had the clear lead in that backfield. The ways that coaches are going to manage these things a little bit different. That was a positive for Singletary for me, but we were talking about Hawkinson talking about these trade deadline guys. Uh, I'm not really talking about Hawkinson. I got going on the Jefferson stuff. But the other guys that are interesting, Jeff Wilson takes over a huge backfield share from Raheem Mostert. Really interested in your thoughts on that. Um, Kadarius Tony seems to fill the Miko Harbin role, scores a touchdown on what Next Gen Stats called the largest amount of separation for any player in any, uh, I think, any reception or any touchdown or something all season, which is amazing because it was in the red zone where everything's condensed but he was just completely forgotten about in the flat. Very similar to how they've used Hardman around the line of scrimmage in the red zone as a space player. Hardman obviously out in this game. Tony only runs 43% of the routes. I'm not entirely sure how to read into that in terms of, look, Hardman's going to be back. Is Tony, you know, not all the way up to speed? Are they going to keep him at like a 50% route roll? But because he looked fantastic. I mean, he looked awesome. He looked like a clear addition to their offense that they – should be happy to use more than this. And so hopefully that's the way that it goes for people who have Kadarius, Tony. And then in Chicago, we saw kind of the different thing. Chase Claypool, his routes actually fell this week to 27% of the dropbacks. Hopefully that builds back up for him, but kind of shows that, you know, again, teams are going to operate a little bit differently and how they're going to do these things. They paid a pretty price to go get him. I think they will eventually have him in a decent role before the end of the season kind of goes back to the notes I was making about Hines where maybe he's just not really ready yet or they're, they don't feel comfortable yet unleashing him. Any thoughts on how these uh, trade deadline acquisitions roles have, have grown or, or not grown? Yeah. I, you, I think you have to really like what the 49ers did moving Wilson to a team where he can have success. You think about how much we hear about the NFL as a business and how, the implication there is that selfishness is pretty important and obviously not exactly selfishness, but I mean, you're working for your own team to try and build it, but you also get a very (laughs) clear note here about how strongly the 49ers believe in Mitchell and why they would feel like Wilson is expendable, even though he's very good, because if you're going to use Mitchell in that kind of role with McCaffrey, even though we don't expect it to continue quite like that, it gives a sense. And, And Mitchell is a very good player. So you like the fact that the 49ers moved Wilson to a team where he can be dynamic. He looks absolutely fantastic. The 24 yard touchdown run that you get from Raheem Mostert is probably his best play of the season. Now it was open, but also he shows that elite speed. We've talked a little bit about how easily he goes down when he does get hit. I almost felt like since the Wilson acquisition that he's been fighting a little bit more to try and emphasize to the coaches that maybe there's not as big a contrast between the two of them in terms of what happens when they get hit as it would otherwise seem 
that's probably not the case. No, I mean, it seems that way. I felt the same way. Like, Mostert suddenly looks like he's running with a little fire under him. Yeah, yeah. And, you know, you look at what happens here. There's no reason for the Dolphins to go away from Wilson, probably the healthier and the less likely to get injured back when he's dominating in a game they're running away with. I don't think that that means that Mostert is done. But you do have to take this and say that Wilson will probably be the lead guy. I think both of these players are probably playable. You love having both of them in best ball because they're going to have games where they score touchdowns. I think we are going to see some more rush success. It's an annoying game if you have a lot of Hill and a lot of Waddle like we do. And yet the fact that the Dolphins can win in so many ways. And if a team comes out and is straightforwardly tries to take away Hill and Waddle, as you see in this one, and the Dolphins can still put up an unlimited number of points on you, that changes the calculation again for the defense. And they have to say, well, I mean, do we want to focus that much on Hill and Waddle because we'll still give up 35 points in a game where, you know, if they had wanted the Dolphins could have scored 50, right? So I, th- I think you have to like that all the way the round from the Dolphins perspective. But again, if you have Jeff Wilson, that's extremely exciting. The Kadarius Tony one is kind of funny because you got the impression that Jacksonville Jaguars have the same scattering report on Tony that the New York Giants did where they're like we're just <laughs> we're going to ignore him he has that hilarious touchdown he does show some good athleticism on it and the hilarious touchdown referring to the broken play where they don't cover him at all he also has one of those I mean it wasn't nearly to the extent of some of the other catches this week but an impressive one-handed catch you like to see that from him he's going to be the after the catch kind of guy you mentioned he doesn't play that much given the fact that these guys are out another just transcendent performance from Patrick Mahomes they do use McKinnon a little bit in this one even though it sounded like he might have been borderline in terms of playing he didn't really look great he basically made no effort when he was the target on Mahomes interception late but this is a game where they lose Juju to not a dirty hit but a play that a flag was picked up that was weird because it was certainly a personal foul he's out Hardman is out you finally get some juice from MVS he plays a decent game for more or less the first time obviously you're still getting Travis Kelsey Tony's just not ready yet and I think if you this is a good time to go buy Sky more I mean his price almost certainly I mean it's going to go lower to zero just are like you talking about like, in dynasty yeah in yeah. dynasty to buy ahead of this deadline a lot of people have in week 11 I mean it can go lower it can go to that point that that Tony is at for that little stretch with the giants where it seems like they don't want him and your chances of getting moved for the chiefs there are, you know, not particularly high. You know, you, you move along and you become a Nicole Harry, you become a Kevin white. I mean, those guys drafted earlier than, than more. I mean, he doesn't actually even get that much of a chance to prove himself, but there's our guys who are just not ready to do the full part of the chiefs offense. But what we see with Tony in this game, very clear cut that he's going to be a weapon for them, that he's a good fit for a lot of the different things that they want him to do. I don't know that he becomes a 100% you know, usage type of guy. I don't think he's going to get up in that range that we have for the wide receiver one tier. But the question that you have to ask is that with how many points this team is going to score and how many passing touchdowns Mahomes is going to have over the next five years, And he can probably even be a little bit of not a niche guy, but a secondary usage type of player and score at least at the wide receiver one two borderline, simply because there are going to be so many total points available. And his ability as an NFL wide receiver, I just, I don't think there's any question that's already above someone like a McCall Hardman. Maybe that's not even the standard hardly anyone is using. It looks like he's going to slot in there ahead of more. I think that Juju, probably a decent piece for them, even though he's on the one-year contract, they probably would like to continue that in the offseason. But right now, Tony looks like he will be the wide receiver one for the Chiefs over the next five years. They've used a lot of different pieces to go after the wide receiver position. Then maybe they go out and draft another guy early. But, I mean, if you had him sitting on your roster as a giant and now he's with the Chiefs, This is beyond a dream scenario because I think that even if you were optimistic about what he would do with Kansas city to make the kinds of plays that he made in his second game with them. I mean, that's basically a best case scenario. Yeah. That's incredible. Um, And I like the way you're, you're talking about that. I mean, they have used a lot of resources at receiver. The chiefs were a really interesting team this week. You mentioned McKinnon still being used a good amount. One of the things that kind of goes a little under the radar, I think in this one 
because McKinnon gets eight targets and Pacheco gets none, there's a lot of discussion of Isaiah Pacheco seeing a bunch of the snaps and actually being the lead runner. And Clyde edwards alaire only playing a few snaps. I mean, completely being forgotten about in the offense. But Pacheco actually ran routes on 45% of dropbacks. McKinnon only at 38%. It's the first time McKinnon hasn't led at routes in a long time as well. Not really that far down for McKinnon because often it's split between Pacheco and CH behind him. I thought that was interesting. The Pacheco, despite no targets, did run a good number of routes in, in addition to his usage bump. So some shifts in their backfield. But then as you talked about in the passing game, this is the first game we've seen where things got shuffled. No Mikael Hardman. First time any of these other receivers have you know been out. And then Juju gets a concussion in game. And what we saw with that was no bump for Sky Moore. So that's why I emphasized, you know, when you're talking about Dynasty, he still stays at 25% of the routes, which is about where he's always been. Justin Watson jumps to 73%, basically takes on those Juju snaps. Or this is the way I was reading it. And then Tony being sort of in the Miko Hardman role. They also got some other guys involved, obviously, because you have to make up a lot of snaps there, but not, not what I would have expected. You know, I mean, Justin Watson's played good football. We've talked about him kind of being a fly in the ointment a little bit, but for Sky Moore to finally be in a position where, you know, they have out of Tony now, but Hardman's out and they know that in advance and they could have been preparing more a little bit for a bigger role, but instead they were preparing Tony for a little bit of a bigger role. And then also the Juju in-game injury and more not seeing any kind of an increase at all. And Justin Watson being the guy that gets up over 70%. A lot of times you'll see both the guys get a bump and they're kind of using multiple guys to fill that unexpected vacancy of routes. Didn't think that was great for, for Sky Moore's 2022 prospects. That It feels like he's pretty buried right now. I'm he's with you that he is a buy low in Dynasty in the sense that probably too much certainty that he's not going to be long-term good. And he's droppable now, even in, in our FFPC leagues, I think, for this year. A lot of emphasis during draft season on the fact that he was not really a vertical weapon for Western Michigan and probably wouldn't be that for the Chiefs either, even though he's a decent weapon. But I also don't think he's a manufactured touch guy or a directly underneath guy. I think he's going to be that intermediate depth target hog, ideally, and eventually, if he ends up being the guy who they want him to be and who you need him to be for fantasy, I think that's where he's going to thrive. So you could argue that it's not a great sign that he doesn't play more when Juju goes out. And yet I do think that there is an element here with the Chiefs where Watson is a good player and their sort of pre-game plan for some of the younger guys is probably not going to shift a lot with these injuries. If the guys aren't ready to execute the things they need to execute, they're just, they're not going to play. Then there were a couple of, names at running back who also went very different directions this week very notable from a snap and usage perspective these two guys kind of linked in my mind one of them i always really like the other one i always really sell you get kind of that way emotionally with some players in fantasy football based on your personal experience with them but they're linked because i think they actually are very similar you have james connor and leonard fournette where you have these big backs who are very clearly plotters, and yet they are good in short yardage, or at least give you the size to make the team feel like they should be good in short yardage. They're either underrated or just competent wide receivers, or not re wide receivers, but competent receiving backs. And so you can use them on every snap and not signal the tendency to the defense. Also, just that flexibility is very, very helpful. And because of that flexibility, they end up with these workhorse roles that in the games where they end up with the snap share that, that all of that would project, they're dynamic fantasy weapons simply because the role is so valuable. They also were resigned to these contracts that seem to somewhat lock them into these roles. But the backup situation, unique. On the one side with the Buccaneers, you have this controversial sort of old running back prospect, but controversial to the upside because Rashad White, very athletic and also brings that receiving ability to the table. So he can do both things for you. And then on the Cardinal side, you have this late round sleeper who's stuck with the team. You pull up his peripherals. You see that he and James Conner come into this week with virtually identical numbers in terms of things like evasion rate. But the big difference between them is that, Eno actually has the burst to be good before contact 
James Conner does not. Huge developments for these two teams, not the least of which is that the backup I just mentioned for the Cardinals no longer with the team. Yeah, that was a surprising release. Some rumors that that had to do with him not being happy about losing his role, which is so interesting because he's stuck with the team for two years as a seventh round pick who wasn't playing at all or getting any kind of an opportunity. I mean, even if he voiced some displeasure, I, I just, I, kind of shocking to me. <laughs> like, what what displeasure would he have even voiced? But um, Connor plays a season high ninety six percent of the snaps. I mean, he's incredibly heavily used in this game. I think that's probably the highest for any running back in the game all year. We've only had a couple 90% snap shares for running backs. I don't think we've had the 100% snap share, which do happen sometimes back in the Christian McCaffrey heyday, the Le'Veon Bell heyday. Those guys would play 100% of the snaps sometimes, but don't think we've had any this year. And I think Connor's 96 this week was a season high for any back. Jonathan Taylor hit 94 this week as well in Jeff Saturday's first game. That was really exciting. He goes on to play the Eagles next week who have been gotten run on a lot without Jordan Davis. I think Jonathan Taylor is going to run like 35 times this week. That's just an aside. For 250. But for 250, yeah. I mean, it just – it seems like hey, – he looked – he had the burst to get. It just seems like there's no – and they were run heavy, and the Eagles' opponents have been run heavy since since that Jordan Davis injury. It's just like I cannot get away from this idea that Jonathan Taylor is definitely running for 30. I don't – you couldn't convince me that he's not running 30 times this week. But yeah, Connor getting the heavy usage. I mean, it's obviously a positive for the rest of the year. We know that he was good in a big role late last season. And now with Benjamin released, I mean, I'm sure they'll use Keontae Ingram a little bit. Maybe Daryl Williams whenever he comes back. He's on IR. Seems like Connor's set up to, to perform really well right now. The, the Fournette stuff, a little harder for me to parse. They went incredibly run heavy. The run heaviest they've been since I think like week two, like all, way earlier in terms of pass rate over expected. Some of that was probably related to the fact that Rashad White was finally showing some rushing efficiency to go with what you and I have talked a little bit about seeing, which is that he looks better than Fournette. He's shown the burst, but he just hadn't been performing well. Nice to see him actually have a good game. Runs for 100 yards, first 100-yard game for a Bucks back since Fournette did that in week one. Fournette has not been running well either, and so this is the really the first any Bucks back has run effectively in quite a while and white kept getting fed ends up with 22 carries really heavy run lean Fournette obviously though gets hurt in this game which is also part of it and yet white started the game so there there you know there are multiple layers here where um the shift was on the shift got heavier than it would have been as as Fournette got hurt and then you have adam schefter reporting right away monday morning Fournette's going to be ready to go in two weeks. And I, I made a little tweet about that, but basically implied that that sounds like that came from Fournette's agent <laughs> because who else has the incentive to say before they've even really gotten back from Munich and, and started any kind of rehab process on Fournette that he's definitely going to be ready two weeks from now. You got a whole bye week coming up. What would be the point of announcing that right away on Monday morning I mean, some people in my mentions noted if it's really not a serious injury, sometimes we do hear right away. It's not that big of a deal. But the, the specific sort of wording that he will be good to play as opposed to, you know, it's not a serious injury or whatever. It just felt a little bit like some concern from Fournette's camp that the Bucks might want to go, we'll hold you out for, you know, week, what is it, week 12 when, you know, they come back from their bye and let Rashad White have a game to, to kind of be the lead back and see how that goes. That's going to be some interesting drama unfolding, but obviously with them going on a bye, not something that we'll see anything on this week. Um, a lot more running back stuff. I was going to say a couple more running back things or one more running back thing, but God, man, there's so much that happened this week. I do really quick want to circle back to the Wilson and Mostert thing. The snap shifted quite a bit towards Wilson. I wrote that it looked like an actually good Ezekiel Elliott role. And then most are sort of the Tony Pollard guy. Do you like that sort of mindset of what they can be going for? More particularly in terms of what Moster is in a 28% snap role. Can you play him in a good offense? You, you mentioned he's not completely does. I think you can still kind of play him as a Pollard big play threat. Yeah. I mean, anytime you have an offense that is going to score a ton of points and now we have reason to believe that they're going to be individual games where they're run heavy. 
or at least create enough value for two backs. It'd be similar to, you can play Elijah Mitchell now. I mean, it's not going to be your preferred avenue. If you have yeah. two studs, you're definitely going to go that direction. But I mean, week 11 is a heavy bye week. Obviously that doesn't help you with the Dolphins since they're one of the teams on the bye. But there are going to be situations with injuries. And I mean, one of the best teams I have right now is a zero RB team with Dave Cabin where we're in good position, even though Mike Williams and Marquise Brown, two of the guys that we selected in that run. And it was the full build with zero RB that allowed us to have the wide receiver depth to get through that. But as a result, I mean, Mostert is someone who, if we make it and then we do well, he's going to need to hit those plays at least some of the time to get us across. I like going at it that way. It, as you mentioned, the Buccaneers, one of the things that jumps out to me is just it's really unfortunate to have the buy now because you would think that, especially if Fournette is a little bit dinged up, White could build on this. What is your takeaway from the fact that you have... I mean, one of the things you just kind of like to see is a truer identity emerge for the Buccaneers, not as much Jekyll and Hyde in terms of how they feel like they need to go about it any given week, and that you're going to see that full workload. One of the things that we had in this game is a huge number of carries. As you pointed out, you get 36 between the two guys. I mean, Fournette had a fine game because he scores a touchdown, but only one target for the two backs, and White doesn't get any. Yeah, I, I I read that as being related to the really heavy negative pass rate over expected um, run heavy lean, not a ton of passing. When they did pass, it seemed to be more deliberate pass plays, which I think don't end up being running back targets as much as opposed to, you know, when you're in a negative script and you're throwing and you're like, ah, well, they're dropping back. I'm going to dump it off to the running back. I mean, it's a little bit of a different type of a play. And so – just not a lot of targets for the running back, but we know there's a team and we know Tom Brady is a quarterback that is going to target the running backs a decent amount. So I wasn't that concerned about that. Like, I just thought that was based on their run heavy, you know, play call this is a, success. Sure. Sure. And I think that is the way to look at it. I just hope that we can get one guy and get them in this kind of fun overall normal offense down the stretch. Right. An annoying week because a lot of these guys that we love are not going to be available for the week 11 push. You have Walker, ETN, White, and Mostert all on the bye. When they come back, the Bucks don't have a great running back schedule either. But if you have a good team, you're excited for White. Or if you have a good team and you don't have him and you want to make a bye week trade, specifically because the team that has him needs to win this week, they do have a soft schedule in week 16 and 17. Fantasy semis and finals, fifth best overall schedule during that stretch. A tiny little note of something that might be interesting. I, and it's interesting because as you say that, I almost am glad that they have a tough running back schedule in the sense of it's not exactly this because the receiving stuff is so important in fantasy. And so when you have tough running back matchups, a lot of times it means that teams just have like really athletic linebackers. They guard the running backs well in the passing game and all of that. But if the Bucs can't run the ball effectively, then they get more pass heavy. And then in this offense, that actually might be the one offense that could score well for fantasy, even if it's a tough running back matchup, because they could catch eight balls or something like that. Right. And so, or they're throwing it down inside the five and they get a short touchdown. I mean, it's a high value touch offense, the way that I look at the upside. And so the tough running back matchups might actually move them away from what they did in this game where they were so run heavy and towards more passing, which could probably benefit. I mean, that's benefited Fournette more when they go run heavy Fournette doesn't tend to score as much. That's when they go pass it. I mean, that's when he can get up to the 25 point games because he gets these short touchdowns and catches eight balls, even though he's not really putting up a ton of yards necessarily. So they might be one offense where I wouldn't be as concerned about the schedule and, and maybe even see it as a slight positive. If, if we get white in that big role, because we know that the, the dump offs from Tom Brady can be there. The, the offense probably should score offense looked better. The passing game looked better. Chris Godwin's eight up higher. The broadcast talking about, uh, him feeling finally healthy. That was another little minor one from this week where he apparently told the broadcast team, you know, we talk about the production meetings and how we can get some insights from those. Sometimes he apparently told him this is going to be his good week. And it looked like it. he looked better. He's getting downfield a dot higher. It's been really, really low. And then also Julio Jones runs a season high 77% routes has a nice touchdown on a crossing pattern and looks the best he's looked all year. Now you start to get the Tampa Bay receivers healthier and, and looking like they were, 
the offense, I mean, still offensive line issues, but the offense could start to trend positively towards the late part of the season. Obviously they're in a weak division. They're still in first place now at this point, even though they've played really poorly, wouldn't be surprising to see the Bucks look a little more like we expected down the stretch. And, and as they get ready for the playoffs, things have worked out well for them. They're, they're certainly not packing it up for the year when, when they're leading their division. Right. So that's sort of my point there. There's a few more running backs I wanted to get to, but we will get to those in the next episode. We've gone very long already today. I, again, I said this at the top. Very exciting week 10. We got more to talk about in our future shows. Got to save some stuff for the future shows. But Ken Walker, exciting usage notes I want to talk about. Christian McCaffrey, we got to dig into a little bit. A lot of under the radar stuff, too, and some of these injuries and, and how we're going to view some of the offenses that lost players like Cooper Cup. Right. I mean, that's a that's a big note. Little things about Rondell Moore getting some air yards, some of those things that are uh, just I mean, I don't know how much time we're going to wind up talking about all that stuff. We always kind of just go go as we go. But I'm excited to do the rest of the shows this week because there's still so much more to discuss. Yeah, week 11 was a big difference maker. And I mean, Ben, we we showed some restraint and did not talk about Rondell Moore during the first show. I mean, that's, that's something. Yeah. So he will factor in. He is a massive riser. I can't wait to get your thoughts on some of these other guys. The fantasy managers will be trying to trade for in front of their redraft windows in front of their dynasty trade deadlines. So that's Miss Dealing Bananas for today. I'm Sean Seek. With me as always is Ben Gretsch, whom you can follow at yards per Gretsch, sign up for stealing signals, sign up for stealing lines. They've just released the new NBA product. So Dalton Cates over there at Stealing Lines with Ben. They've added Mike Brody, one of our favorite guys, does Apex for fantasy football. He's going to be doing some NBA content for them. You won't want to miss that. It is part of your Stealing Lines subscription, not a new piece. We'd obviously love to have you over at Rotoviz. You can use the coupon code RV Radio 2022 at checkout to get a 10% discount on your one year subscription. I mentioned earlier in the show the work that Connor is doing. Dave Cabin has the awesome wide receiver cornerback matchup piece and with the passing matchup Raider. So many other great things out there with Blair Andrews. Some of the young guys doing a great job with the advanced running back stats, with the advanced wide receiver stats. Got some cool matchup pieces for you on other elements of the schedule using the streamer. Love to have everybody over there. Sign up to the feed, leave us a rating and review, drop us a comment on YouTube, all of those things help us with the algorithm. We love you guys. We'll talk to you soon.